Good morning. Good morning. All right, so we are doing a CLIAC review on gynecology. And this is a very big topic, obviously. Um, so I was kind of, I'm not sure how you guys have done this before, but what I did was I um, asked Robin to kindly provide me with um, the summary for each of your CREAG scores last year, and then it actually breaks it down by subtopic. So I went through and found the top subtopics that were missed among all PGY levels. So I thought we could go over those today. Um, for hopefully the most high yield kind of um, review. So the top four topics that were missed across the board with all PGY levels were intraoperative complications, pediatric and adolescent gyne, menopause, and then also cervical dysplasia. I'm not gonna go over that today because I know you guys just had a lecture, I believe with Dr. Oliver um, last month on cervical dysplasia. Um, but I mentioned that so you remember to go over it before your pre exam, especially with the new ASCCP guidelines which came out this year. So within intra-op complications, obviously there are a lot of possible complications that can occur, um, but the two subtopics within this subtopic that you guys um, missed most consistently and that also for those who have taken creams before know are pretty high yield are nerve injuries and then injuries to the GU tract. So as for nerve injuries, these complicate about 2% of GYN surgeries and the most common causes include um, positioning and retractor use. Less common causes of nerve injury during GYN surgery include nerve transection, entrapment, and thermal injury. Um, and for treatment, usually this is treated conservatively with time and physical therapy. Nerve injuries tend to improve, especially um, stretch injuries. But medications can be used, so TCA and anticonvulsants. I've seen gabapentin used before um, for patients with nerve injuries, as well as um, SSRIs and SNRIs. And then if the patient has a nerve transection, then obviously you consult neurosurgery to help repair it. Or a more simple surgery, if you suspect nerve entrapment, you could remove the offending stitch. So this is just an illustration from prologues, um, and it sort of demonstrates the different nerves, some of the different nerves that can be injured. Um, so one thing to not forget is the brachial plexus. So when patients are in steep Trendelenburg, um, for example, with laparoscopic surgery, um, if their arms aren't well positioned, they can actually have a stretch injury to the brachial plexus. So I know that we often think about nerves in the pelvis, um, but the brachial plexus is another commonly injured nerve as well. All right, so I have this table here, and um, I thought we could kind of go through um, the different mechanisms of injury, motor, and sensory deficits with each of these nerves. And on the next slide, we have all of the answers. So. Um, you guys can either type into the chat, or if you know the answer, you can just unmute yourself. Um, but with femoral nerve, do you guys know some examples of mechanisms of injury? Retraction. Yes. The big ones. Yep. Anything else? They flex the hips too much when they're in dorsal autonomy. Exactly. So going back to our last slide, this patient is in candy canes, and you can imagine if her hip is uh, flexed at uh, more of an acute angle, she could get a femoral nerve injury. All right, and then there's one other big one. I'll just tell you. It's the, did someone say incision? I said hyperextension, but... I guess that too. <laughs> yeah, you would think like usually it says hyperflexion, but I could totally see how hyperextension could cause a flex injury. Um, the hyperflexion is because the nerve actually gets trapped under the inguinal ligament. So that's why that specifically can cause the femoral nerve injury. 
Um, the other one is the incision type. So fan and steel and Maillard incisions can also cause femoral nerve injury. Um, does anyone know the motor deficit? Knee extension. Yeah, no patellar reflex. Yes, lack of patellar reflex and then quadriceps weakness. Um, so it tends to be more um, kind of going from the seated to standing position that people have weakness and they're unable to do that. But Andrew, did you say extension or flexion of the knee? Uh, extension of the knee. Yeah, so I think extension as well of the knee. Okay, perfect. And then for sensory, people can have um, sensory um, effects along the anterior and medial thigh. Okay, so ilioinguinal and iliohypogastric. Um, so this can occur with uh, a certain incision that we use frequently during C section. So what would that be? Fan and steel. Yes. Um, and then also um, something to think about is you can have nerve entrapment. So sometimes um, with your fan and steel, if you're like closing up those layers, people can, I've seen people have this nerve injury very lateral and then when you uh, release the stitch or inject a lidocaine in that area, they can have some relief there. And then during laparoscopic surgery, um, your lateral trophars can also injure this nerve. Um, for this, is there typically a motor deficit? No. Nope. And then what sort of sensory loss do they have? It's like to the mons and the inner upper inner thigh. Mm-hmm. Yep. So mons, groin area, and medial thigh. And the name of these nerves kind of gives it away a little bit, right? So inguinal region or groin region and yeah, I guess you can extrapolate that to along the medial thigh. Um, genital femoral and lateral femoral cutaneous. Do you guys know what um, mechanism of injury may occur with these? Um, I think it's with the like retractors. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And lateral femoral cutaneous has got to be like hyper, hyper flexion of the hips too, right? Because that's what causes, when you have like myalgia parasthetica, that's the lateral femoral cutaneous, isn't it? Yes, it is. Um, I think that that, and so with these two, I usually think of them as non-motor. Um, yeah. And you're correct that they can have this burning pain with the lateral femoral cutaneous down the anterior and kind of posterior lateral aspect of the thigh. Um, and then the genital femoral, the name of the nerve kind of gives it away. So it's the numbness of labia and um, upper medial thigh as well. And then Rudy is absolutely right. So the retractor blade can injure these nerves. So for example, if you are using the Buchwalter retractor um, during an open hist, um, the blades can kind of shear these nerves because they lay right along the psoas muscle. Um, and then also pelvic um, lymph node dissection as well can um, damage these nerves. Okay, obturator, similarly, lymph node dissection, any deep dissection like with endometriosis can um, damage the obturator nerve, as well as, um, I'm not sure if your ureal guides do trans obturator tape or mostly the mid urethral sling, but the TOTs can damage this nerve as well. Um, do you guys know which motor deficit would occur? You the can't stripper. adduct. Adduct, mm -hmm. the stripper muscles. Adduct, exactly. And then numbness of inner thigh. And then the common uh, peroneal or common fibular. Um, so what would we, what could cause this injury? Positioning. Positioning, yep. So um, this patient here, if this patient um, had this nerve pressed up against this candy cane for hours and hours, you can imagine that an injury could occur there. And then um, what are the motor deficits with this? Foot drop. Foot drop, yep, and dorsiflexion, and then the, they can have numbness along the dorsum of the foot. Funny story, one of my attendings in residency actually collapsed from foot drop after performing a long laparoscopic surgery from endo because she was leaning up against the table for like four or five hours and didn't realize it. 
and then she had to do like PT and everything because she oh. injured herself during surgery by her oh. own personal positioning. That is pretty cool. All right, so here's our filled in table. Um, we'll share this PowerPoint with you guys. You can use this to study. I also put the nerve roots on this version of the table. And then here's just a little um, illustration here. So you can see, I'm sorry, it's a little blurry, but it kind of shows the areas of uh, sensory loss. So lateral hemocutaneous. Um, and then here, the iliohypogastric, you can imagine hypogastric area. So kind of below the belly button along the uh, inguinal ligament. And then um, ilioinguinal tends to be more down here. Prevention of nerve injury, so avoiding malpositioning. So you want your patient to have minimal abduction, minimal hip rotation. Um, I always tell like interns and the medical students when they're in um, yellow constructs, you want kind of their knee to line up diagonally with their contralateral shoulder. Um, you want to pad their hips, you want to pad the lateral fibula to avoid uh, peroneal nerve injury. You want their knees and hips moderately flexed at about 90 degrees. Um, you want their heels seated in the stirrups um, to prevent stretch injury. And then um, prolonged lithotomy as well, something you want to avoid. So some people, for example, like during a long Euroguide case, after a couple hours, will actually drop the legs down into a more neutral position for like five minutes. Um, I don't think there's anything scientific or any data about how long you should relieve them from lithotomy, but that's something you can do. Um, and then in the up-to-date article about nerve injury, they actually talk about taking the patient out of lithotomy altogether after four hours and putting them in a supine position. That seems like a lot of work to totally reposition someone and you have to recreate and everything. So I don't really think that's practical, but it is something that is suggested. Um, extreme Trendelenburg, so using the gel pad or the pink pad to avoid sliding and stretch injury during Trendelenburg can help um, protect the brachial plexus. And then um, paying attention to your incision location as well as um, your retractors to avoid shearing those nerves that lay along the psoas muscle. All right, so a couple questions. Um, so we have a 48-year-old patient with a BMI of 19. She undergoes a total abdominal hysterectomy in the supine position. She had a fan and steel incision, a self-retraining retractor was used, surgery was 90 minutes. The next morning, she falls getting out of bed, and her exam shows an absent patellar reflex. So what do you think is the most likely mechanism of injury here? And which nerve is injured? Patient positioning. Yep. Well, actually, no, sorry, that's not no, the right the answer. Placement. Placement. Yep, yep, yep. So, yeah, when I first read this question, I think, of course, her positioning, but she's actually in the supine position, so lower risk for nerve injury. So, yes, the correct answer is retractor placement. And then, um, which nerve is injured? Femoral. Yep. And how do we know it's femoral? Absent patellar reflex. Mm -hmm. And also falling when going kind of from a seated to standing position, getting out of bed. Um, what in her history makes her at higher risk for having this injury? Her BMI. Yeah, so unusual that a low BMI would put you at risk for something, but for nerve injury, it definitely does. Um, and then with our retractor placement and choice, we can choose to use the shortest blades possible and just confirming the location to prevent this type of injury. Okay. A 45-year-old undergoes a TBH. She's in dorsal lobotomy, who's in handicap stirrups. The procedure lasted an hour. On um, post-op day one, she has difficulty walking and has foot drop and numbness of the lateral leg. What's the mechanism of injury? Probably positioning. Mm -hmm. And which nerve is injured here? Mm -hmm. um, the common mm -hmm. perineal nerve. Exactly. Peroneal, however yeah. you see it. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, she has a pretty classic presentation foot drop, candy cane stirrups. Um, so we can pad the lateral calf to avoid this injury. 
All right. And then now we have a 25 year old patient. She is seen on post up day two after an X lap and right self injectomy for a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Um, the surgeon uses a fan steel um, and a self retraining retractor. The procedure is 45 minutes. And she describes a sharp burning pain over her right mom, upper leg, and groin. Oops, I showed you guys the answer. My bad. Well, it's incision and placement. <laughs> Which nerve is injured here? Leoinguinal. Well, yeah, so what, how do we know that? Mom's an inner thigh. Exactly. And a fan and steel. Mm -hmm. And here's just a little picture that shows the nerve distribution of the ilioinguinal and iliohypogastric. Um, so you also have to be careful if this surgery were done laparoscopically about where you're placing your lateral ports. So you have to use AFAS um, and stay well above that as you guys always do with the two up and two over to avoid this territory of getting into nerve injury. Okay, moving on to GU injuries. So ureteral injury is fairly rare, 0.2 to 2% risk of ureteral injury during nine surgery. Um, and the risk factors for injury to bladder and ureter include things like previous C-sections, previous abdominal surgeries, endometriosis, so really anything that causes increased scarring in the pelvis, broad ligament lyomyoma, and low volume surgeons. So this slide shows the course of the ureter as well as some bladder anatomy. So the bladder or the ureter typically is 25 to 30 centimeters in length and it is um, divided up into these three um, zones. So you have the proximal ureter that goes from the renal pelvis and that goes down to the upper border of the SI joint, zone two transverses the SI joint, and then zone three is from the inferior portion of the SI to the ureter ureteral orifice in the bladder, which is um, within the trigone here. So can someone describe the course of the ureter to me? Uh, it goes from your kidney down I guess I don't know as much along, kind of like along your the, the back wall, and then it courses anterior to your iliacs or your where your bifurcation is, and then along the pelvic brim, and then it goes um, posterior to your uterine artery. It's like a couple centimeters from the cervix, and then into the bladder. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so typically it's described, as you said, it kind of, of course is straight down from the renal pelvis, um, kind of along that psoas muscle here. And then, um, yep, you described how it crosses the iliac vessel. Um, can someone kind of tell me a little bit about its relationship to the IP? And I feel like this drawing actually doesn't show it very well. So here's our IP here. I was struggling to find, of course, a ureter um, diagram that wasn't male anatomy. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so the IP uh, is not totally accurate right here. But can somebody tell me that relationship? At the, like, pelvic brim, at the pelvic brim, they're just a few centimeters apart. It's like posterior and sometimes a little medial to it. The ureter, yeah. So the IP typically goes above the ureter. And then, um, and then it kind of comes medially. So the surgical significance of this is if you're doing a retroperitoneal dissection, you want to go lateral and parallel, um, kind of parallel along the IP to avoid getting into the ureter. And then when you want to expose your ureter, so for example, when you're creating that window underneath your IP, um, you're gonna want to retract the IP medially in order to see the ureter and that retroperitoneal space that you've dissected. Um, and then as Molly was saying, so it kind of dives down, it, in its anatomic position, it actually comes way lateral along the side of the pelvis, um, but that isn't appreciated surgically because once you get into the broad ligament, it kind of falls medially with that medial 
since, as we know, it travels with the medial leaf of the rod. And then um, in terms of its relationship to the cervix, um, typically a centimeter and a half from the internal ox. So for the intern, when you're manipulating or telling you push in, push in, push in, that's because it actually stretches and increases that distance from the ureter to the internal os to prevent um, injury. Questions about the course of the injury? Yeah. Okay. So in terms of the most common times to injure um, the GU tract. So bladder mobilization and cup closure, especially if you have that patient who's had a bunch of C-sections and you're attempting to um, create that bladder, bladder flap. Ligation of the uterine artery. So that can occur, um, you know, when you're doing that um, ligation and burning at the internal os um, or below um, the uterine artery if you go too lateral. Um, and then at the pelvic frame with your IP ligament transection. Types of ureteral injury, so entrapment or kinking. Um, so if that occurs, you could potentially, for example, release a stitch if you have accidentally stitched um, and occluded the ureter that way. Um, ligation or crush injury, so this is devascularization um, of the ureter. So the extent of the injury depends on the type of instrument. So if it's just a, an atraumatic um, grasper used for retraction versus accidentally ligating it with the ligature. And then also the duration of the clamp closure of that clamp on the ureter. And minor injuries require sending home. And then um, transection of the ureter, Obviously, it has to be repaired by urology. The type of repair depends on the location. And then finally, thermal injury. So the repair uh, depends on the extent of the injury. And then cystoscopy. So we always look with our cystoscope um, at the end of our hysterectomy, or at least most people do. Um, so what type of injuries would cysto identify and what type of injury would cysto not necessarily identify? So a cysto will not identify a, a thermal injury. Mm -hmm. Exactly, because that tends to be delayed. And then if you have entrapment or a transection, then you wouldn't see ureteral efflux and you would be a little more suspicious of those injuries at the time of cysto. Okay, so we are performing a cysto after a sacrospinous ligament fixation and it reveals absent urine efflux from the ureter, the right ureter. Um, we attempt to uh, pass a stent, we are unable to. The stitches are removed from the right sacrospinous ligament with repeat cysto with a brisk ureteral jet. What is the best management strategy here? We've basically already done it. Spectrum to management. Yeah, so we removed our stitch and uh, presumably we have solved the problem and we don't need to do anything else. Okay, now we're in the TLH. Um, we have caused a crush injury on the right ureter four centimeters from the ureteral orifice. The injury was performed by an atraumatic grasper used during uterine artery skeletonization. The grasper is used with minimal pressure and duration. Cysto reveals minimal efflux from the right ureter. What is the best management strategy here? Standing. Yep, so what type of injury is this? A crush injury. Crush, yep. And then would you consider this to be minor or major? We just use the blunt atraumatic grass for, for a few seconds. Minor, yep. Um, so yeah, the extent of the devascularization would depend on um, the type like we talked about, like a sure versus just a regular old grasper, and then the duration of the clamp closure. 
and these minor injuries, uh, crush injuries or made with consenting alone. Okay, now we are doing ureterolysis for severe retroperitoneal fibrosis during a laparoscopic excision of endometriosis. We are very talented and we can perform all of these subspecialty surgeries. Um, during the dissection, the ureter is completely transected lateral to the uterine. Can we stat right now? We're not sure if we should go or not. Oh. Uh, I guess we're going to run downstairs if that's okay. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so we transected our ureter lateral to the insertion of the left uterosacral and we are close to the bladder. So what is our management here? I think you can do a ureter neocystotomy. And why did you choose that option? Because you're really close to the bladder already, so you can kind of re-implant the ureter. Exactly. Let's get into that a little bit. So, with ureteral transection, and every year before pre-ags, I always had to go over this because we obviously don't really do this. Um, we would call it urology. So the extent of the injury. So if half of the diameter of the ureter is damaged then you, the urologist can just repair it with stitches. If more is more than half is damaged, then you have to um, do anaphthalmosis or reimplantation. And they always put a stent in, and that is to avoid stricture, scarring, and urine um, extravasation. And sometimes an intra-abdominal drain might be placed just to uh, allow an early diagnosis of leakage of urine from that ureter. The location of the injury is important. So is it distal or is it proximal? So in this case, that patient had a distal ureteral injury because it was right next to the bladder. So this um, typically is uh, repaired with reimplantation or a ureter neocystotomy. Um, and it's very important to not have a lot of tension. So sometimes they do a psoas hitch um, that is where the bladder is kind of tacked up and anchored to the psoas, and that's just on the suture. If the bladder is not in close proximity, then we would do something like a ureteral ureterostomy. So, in this patient, she has stage four endo, she underwent a laparoscopic LSO. We note absent urine efflux from the left ureter on our cisco. They attempt to do a stent. They meet resistance of seven centimeters. And then a two centimeter thermal injury at the pelvic rim is revealed. Um, adequate mobilization of the bladder is achieved without tension. What is the best management strategy? I mean, D because it's pretty high. Yeah, it's high. And then also it says that um, we have good mobilization. So that's what they're getting at here. We don't need the psoas hitch because the bladder is well mobilized. So this is a proximal ureteral injury. So the blad or the injury is high, seven centimeters, as Morgan pointed out. I think that was Morgan. Um, so that would be the upper two thirds of the ureter. So in those zones one and two. So this requires a primary anastomosis or reimplantation. A bori flap is something that I feel frequently comes up on creogs and boards. Um, and that is something where they actually use a little bit of bladder tissue to create a flap to then anastomose to the ureter. And that is one of those procedures that decreases tension. Kidney can be mobilized as well if there's too much tension. And then a trans ureter ureterostomy would be if you've actually took one ureter and divided it and reconnected it to the contralateral ureter. And then finally, we have a bladder injury. 
So now we have a 56 year old woman. She's a D3, D3. She's undergoing a laparoscopic RSO for a six centimeter right adnexal mass. And we um, gain our peritoneal entry at the umbilicus. However, we do decide to put in a 10 millimeter accessory port in the suprapubic area. And the Foley bag immediately fills with gaps. You note a 10 millimeter defect in the dome of the bladder. So besides maintaining our Foley for 14 days, what is the most appropriate intervention? Isn't that like a Close it. Close it. Oh, it so, um, bladder injury with trocar placement is rare, but if you are performing a super pubic cord, it can occur. Um, one thing that I have seen done a lot is actually back filling the bladder before you plan where you're going to put that port just to avoid um, injury. So with bladder injury, um, we can confirm the location with cysto, or I've never seen this done before, but apparently you can also insert the laparoscope through the defect to determine is the dome injured or is the trigon injured. So um, can someone talk to me about if we have a trigon injury why is that more difficult to repair? Where your ureters are inserting, so you have to be careful not to kink your ureteral insertion. Exactly. And then the urethra inserts into that area as well, so you just have a lot of really crucial structures. Exposure is also challenging because this area is posterior and inferior. So if you have a bladder injury during a C-section, for example, it's probably just at the dome of the bladder and you can see it really well and exposed with callus clamps. But if it's in the trigone, that's going to be difficult to see. Um, so typically the urologist will um, involve stenting in this area when they are um, repairing a bladder injury. And then um, if there's an extended bladder injury, um, they would do a resection. So answer to you in that previous question. Um, if we injure the dome of the bladder, the size is um, important and that impacts how it's repaired. So if we have a very, very small defect um, that is less than five millimeters, what would you guys, what would you guys do? Leave it. Yes, you can leave it. Um, you still would want to drain the bladder for seven to 14 days. Um, and typically the bladder will re-epithelialize itself in three to four days, and it will completely be back at its normal strength at 21 days. Um, if we have a larger than five millimeter defect, what would you do then? Repair it, yes. So you can do a one to two layers of absorbable suture like Lipril or Monocryl. And when you're done, you want to ensure that it's watertight. So you can do that by installing something like methylene blue or sterile milk to make sure that there's no leak. And then you similarly would decompress the bladder for seven to 14 days with the catheter and then um, typically perform a cystogram. Do you guys know what a cystogram is? How, what are the steps of that? It looks like the germ, what's the point of it? You fill the bladder with um, radio opaque material and see if there's a leak somewhere. Exactly, so you fill it up with some dye and then typically they'll do like a CT scan um, to determine if there's any leak. And then when you're doing your cysto in terms of more minor injuries, if you just notice that there is suture in the bladder, so say that you close the cuff laparoscopically and some suture got in the bladder, you just remove the stitch, re-cysto to confirm there's no laceration um, related to the stitch, and then you would reclose your cuff. Okay, Questions about any of that stuff before we move on to our next big topic here? 
Okay. All right, so moving on. So pediatric and adolescent dying. Um, so this is tough because we don't have a pediatric or adolescent gynecologist. We didn't at my program either. So a lot of this is just learning through studying for pre-ops. Um, but of all of the topics, there were two very consistently missed subtopics. So just general vulval vaginitis and vulvar concerns related to pediatrics and adnexal masses. Um, however, when you guys are studying, make sure that you look over all of the pediatric stuff. So dysmenorrhea um, was somewhat commonly missed, but almost more by PGY levels. So make sure for the juniors especially you're studying that, it's called contraception. And then um, amenorrhea, I'm not going to cover, or malarian anomalies, because I'm pretty sure you guys probably covered that at your REI um, review. And then menorrhagia is another big one. And I know you guys are really good for doing your abnormal uterine bleeding review systems to determine if the patient has any um, you know, reasons like why they would have a coagulopathy um, causing your menorrhagia. So, Starting off with some questions again. So we have a six-year-old girl. She has vulvar irritation and pleuritis. Um, she has thin white skin surrounding the vagina and anus, and she has fissures. What's the most likely diagnosis here? Lichen sclerosis. Correct. So here's a little diagram. So it looks so. Lichen sclerosis tends to be, for the most part, a bimodal distribution. So young girls who have an gone through puberty and then older postmenopausal women. So it looks very similar in pediatrics. They have this thin white epithelium and the distribution is in a figure of eight or hourglass configuration around the vulva and the anus. It's itchy, little girls may itch this area and have excoriations. And in children, it tends to be a clinical diagnosis. So rarely would you biopsy this. One, because it's traumatizing and scary for little <laughs> girls to have a biopsy. You don't want to cause any scarring or disfiguration of the area. And then also the risk of it being cancer, like a squamous um, cell carcinoma, is very, 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 very low in pediatrics. So that is why it's typically a clinical diagnosis. Um, it's treated with high potency topical steroids. Do you guys know what type we typically use? Same as in older women. What type of what we use? The steroid. Clobetazole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then typically this resolves at puberty. Okay, now we have an 18-month-old girl. She's evaluated for a current UTI, and her physical exam reveals a closed vagina. What's the most likely diagnosis? Um, an imperforate hymen. So it could be an imperforate hymen, but... Labial adhesions. Are they, yeah. 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 Okay. Labial adhesions. So with labial adhesions, you tend to have an agglutination of the labia minora at the midline. And then there's a teeny tiny little area at the top near the urethra where they can pee. And then all of the urine gets backed up behind this adhesion and it can cause dribbling of urine and it can cause UTIs. So that's why this like with an imperfect hymen, um, they still are able to pee. They're not really getting a lot of collection of, they're not getting collection of urine behind the imperfect hymen. Does that make sense why that is not the correct answer and it's labial adhesions instead? Um, for treatment, typically they start off with supportive cares. So just Vaseline, gentle traction to the area to see if that adhesion will open up. And then topical estrogen actually with Premarin is the next go-to. And rarely would something like surgery or procedure be needed to release the adhesion. Okay, now we have a five-year-old girl. She has foul-smelling discharge. It has worsened over the past month. 
She has a normal vulva and minimal dark brown discharge of the introitus. Does she have a foreign object, STI, precocious puberty, or a laceration? Foreign object. Foreign object. Foreign object. Okay, so a foreign object is very common. Um, and they have just as this patient foul smelling vaginal discharge, sometimes in bleeding. What's the most common retained foreign object? Toilet paper. Okay. Yes, correct. Good job. Um, and then how do we remove it? Um, a lavage. Yep, yep. So irrigation is the best way to remove it. Um, often just with the lateral and gentle downward traction, you can see it, you can try to irrigate it out. Um, typically you want to avoid using a speculum. And then what are some other etiologies of um, vaginal bleeding and foul smelling discharge in a prepubertal pre girl? Abuse. Mm -hmm. Just poor hygiene. Mm -hmm. There's one bacteria. Mm. Isn't it respiratory bacteria? I don't know. Is it Shigella? Oh yeah, Shigella. Yeah, Shigella. I think of that more diarrhea and then vaginal issues. No, but I honestly am not sure if it also can cause respiratory issues. Does anyone know? Mm, I don't know. I don't think so, but it could. Um, so that's typically a genital culture to diagnose. It's treated with bathroom. And then STIs related to abuse. So signs of sexual abuse in young girls, um, behavioral changes such as bedwetting, and then for physical exam findings in addition to STIs, they can have um, an acute laceration at the midline, kind of at the posterior horseshoe, and then um, disruption of the hymen, and that's typically posteriorly from four to eight o'clock. This is in comparison to a straddle injury, so if, you know, a young girl just falls and injures her vulva. Do you guys know where the injury would typically be? At six o'clock, I think. Typically not six. Oh, I don't know. So that tends to be more of an anterior injury. Um, and that's because in girls who have an AFM puberty, there just isn't a lot of fat distribution in that area. So if they fall while they're riding a bike or something, that injury is more likely to be anterior. Um, if it does affect the hymen, it tends to be more um, lateral and more anterior. So it's pretty rare that the posterior foreshot at six o'clock would be affected. And if you think about the mechanism of injury, that makes sense. Okay, moving on to pediatric pelvic masses. So now we have a 12 year old. She has a three week history of intermittent left, or I'm sorry, right lower quadrant pain. Um, she went through menarche a year ago. Her last period was six weeks ago. She denies sexual activity. She has a large, firm, mildly tender right sided pelvic mass. She has an ultrasound which shows a 15 centimeter right ovarian mass with solid components and edema and moderate free fluid. Normal CA125, LDH is 850, beta HCG is 109, AFP is 8. That's the likely diagnosis. Dysterminoma? Mm -hmm. Yep, dysterminoma. So, um, what type of tumor is that? So, when we think about Ovarian cancers, we have epithelial germ cell, cell and the yeah. germ cell, exactly. So, with these patients with a pelvic mass and pediatric population, we want to get their menstrual history and their sexual history. Um, we want to perform a transabdominal ultrasound um, for girls who have not gone through puberty and are not yet sexually active rather than a transvaginal. And most masses that we find would be benign. Um, however, 
um, ovarian cancers comprise one to two percent of childhood malignancies. And malignant features would include things like a mass greater than 10 centimeters that looks irregular rather than like a large, smooth surface, um, you know, simple looking cyst. Um, papillary excrescences. And then if you have solid components and ascites. So our patient had a large mass, it was irregular, it had some solid components and ascites. Which tumor markers would you guys want to get? They got them, um, but. AFP, HCG, and inhibit, well, all of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So for germ cell tumors, um, so for just dysgerminoma, for example, which tumor markers would be elevated? LDH mm -hmm. and maybe HCG. And then for an endodermal sinus tumor. AFP. Yeah. And then a choriocarcinoma. HCG. And then immature teratomas. Mm, nothing. Well, there are, it's more, <laughs> there's more of a variety of tumor markers that we have. We can look at it on the next slide. So like when I was studying for step one, I don't know if any of you guys did papilloma, but I thought that the way that he explained it made a lot of sense to me because with the germ cell, these are all the different types of tissue that a germ cell can eventually make. And then if you think about it, the tumor markers that go along with it kind of makes a little more sense. So for example, non-gestational choriocarcinoma, that can mimic placenta on histology, so the beta HCG is high. Um, that one's pretty easy, obviously, because with we think of molar pregnancies and how we turn the beta. But an endodermal sinus tumor mimics yolk sac, so AFP would be high. Dysterminoma, oocyte, LDH, beta HCG. And then with teratoma, it would mimic just fetal tissue. So that's why you kind of have more of a variety, so you can have a 125. Um, so I think about how like a teratoma can have um, skin, so epithelium, CA 125, and then also LDH and AFP, and then an embryonal carcinoma, also fetal tissue, also several types of tumor markers. So dysgerminomas, um, these are the most common malignant germ cell tumor, and they also tend to occur in um, young women in the adolescent and youth population. And 5% of them actually arise in phenotypic females with abnormal gonads, such as patients with um, androgen insensitivity syndrome. And uh, the treatment, this is kind of beyond the scope. I, I don't think you would be asked this on triads, but typically they have resection of the primary lesion, and then they would have chemotherapy with that for um, metastatic disease. And then someone else mentioned the granulosa cell tumors. So this tends to be a bimodal age distribution of reproductive age and then postmenopausal. Um, and about 5% occur in girls um, that have not yet gone through puberty. They secrete, secrete estrogen. So you would want to suspect it if you have a young girl who's going through um, precocious puberty and she also has an enlarged pelvic mass. And then also menorrhagia. Um, what will we see in like a postmenopausal woman? Bleeding, vaginal bleeding. Yep, and they can have endometrial cancer and high rates of endometrial cancer. And then what are the tumor markers? Someone said them before. I think it was mine. In heaven. Yep, inhibit A and B. Okay, so now we have a 14 year old female. She is healthy, she goes to the ER, she has severe right lower quadrant pain, nausea and vomiting. Her review of systems is otherwise negative. Menarche occurred at age 11. She has regular periods every 29 days with minimal cramping. She is not yet sexually active, per her report. What is on your differential and what uh, diagnostics? 
to do obtain. Georgia. Yeah, um, a ruptured cyst, an ectopic pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And then non GYM. Appendicitis. Yep, appy. Yep, that would be at the top of your differential as well. Okay, so you do your ultrasound and it shows a cyst and it shows that it's about seven centimeters, the right ovary. The right ovary is enlarged compared to the left ovary. Let's say the left ovary is two centimeters um, and there's decreased flow. So what do we suspect? Torsion. Torsion. So this is from the ACOG committee opinion on adolescent torsion. So um, basically you want to get your transabdominal ultrasound, especially in a patient that has a gone through puberty and is not sexually active. And then for findings, an enlarged heterogeneous ovary, the ovary sizes tend to be asymmetric um, compared to each other. You can have multiple peripheral follicles Courses, the follicles can get pushed out to the periphery, and then a whirlpool sign. We'll look at a picture of that in a second. So that would lead you to do a diagnostic laparoscopy. Um, and then if the ovaries look normal, obviously you want to look for other etiologies. If the pain persists, if the pain resolves, you can observe, you can observe um, but patients can have intermittent torsion, um, especially in the pediatric population, even without an ovarian booster mass. If they have intermittent torsion and it's an ongoing problem, sometimes people will do an um, ophropexy where they actually take the, they placate the uterine ovarian to the anterior leaf of the breast. Go ahead and watch that one. It's like six years old. So this is a whirlpool sign. I feel like you read about this a lot, but I don't really see many radiologists talking about this. I don't know about you guys. Um, but it has this sort of spiral look. To the Doppler flow, and that represents the twisted pedicle. So for ovarian torsion, 30% of torsion cases do occur in females under age 20. Um, you guys know well about the presentation. Severe sudden onset pain tends they tend to have nausea, vomiting. The right side is more likely to be affected than the left. Do you guys know why that is? What other structures? The colons, the, the colons in the way on the left. Yep, exactly. So the sigmoid colon is there taking up a bunch of space. So there's just less room for that ovary to kind of catch on the pelvic side wall and twist around its vasculature. Um, malignancy is rare. Typically, you know, it'll be a serous or mesonic adenoma or dermoid. And then for pediatric torsion, we do want to spare their ovary, obviously. So in the ACOG committee opinion, they talk about how it's kind of a myth that if the ovary is black or blue, it absolutely means that the ovary is necrosed and the ovary must be removed. So they talk about detorsion, they talk about how you know a cystectomy is not necessarily required. It can lead to additional trauma. And then forcing you in the intra-op, you know, when you're in the OR, there's a lot of bleeding or trauma, and forcing you to do an ectectomy. Um, they talk about how if you have a very large cyst, you can actually just drain it and then you repeat an ultrasound. And if there's a persistent cyst, you can perform a cystectomy to avoid recurrent torsion. Um, they also talk about how pediatric gynecologists do a much better job of preserving the ovary compared to just a pediatric general surgeon. So I didn't really see a lot of this in residency because we didn't have a PEDS GYM surgeon. Um, so it's sort of interesting to think about because I know with our adult patients, we often just, you know, see a black or blue ovary and remove the whole ovary if we don't have restoration or, you know, flow after observing for a couple of minutes after the torsion. Okay, moving on to the other side of the spectrum in terms of our patients, menopause. So um, and I think we have, yeah, we have about 10 minutes, so this topic will be quick. Um, but 
how would you guys define menopause? No period for 12 months. No Correct. Yep. And then patients typically will have vasomotor symptoms. So that includes hot flashes and night sweats. Um, and the etiology of that is the ovary has decreased function. There is decreased estradiol and progesterone. 75% um, of menopausal women experience vasomotor symptoms, and those symptoms on average last five to seven years. However, I'm sure that you guys have met plenty of patients that have them for more than 10 years, um, if not longer. Um, and then there's also genitourinary syndrome of menopause, which we'll talk about in a second here. Um, so we have a 60-year-old woman. She has known um, GUF. Or GSM, I'm sorry, she has recurrent UTI. What is the best treatment option for her? Estrogen. Perfect. Not cranberry. Um, okay, so GSM says this is due to estrogen deprivation of the uh, vulvar and vaginal tissues. And what are some symptoms of? Uh, sorry, you're just saying symptoms of? Of um, like GSM, the gender urinary, urinary syndrome. Dyspareunia, mm -hmm. vaginal bleeding, mm -hmm. atrophy. Yeah, exactly. And then they also can have urinary incontinence and recurrent UTIs. Do you guys know that? pathophysiology for why they have the current UTIs. It has to do with the pH. Lack of estrogen. Say that again? La a lack of estrogen. Yeah, so with the lack of estrogen, it converts the pH of the vagina from acidic to basic. And then this allows more um, problematic bacteria to grow rather than just the typical lactobacilli of the vagina. And then that can then cause infections, which can also cause incontinence. So what would you guys typically see on your exam? The patient comes in, she has dyspareunia, vaginal dryness, what are some of the things you would see on her vulvar exam? You might see um, like lack of the architecture. So the labia uh, minora might um, kind of fuse with the majora. Uh, yeah, definitely. Loss of the vaginal um, like folds. Those I don't know how to say this word. Ruga. Mm -hmm. Ruga. Mm -hmm. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, so that's typically what you'll see. And then you can just see more pallor in general. So if you put a speculum in the vagina rather than looking pink and well estrogenated, things can just look a little more pale. Um, but yes, definitely loss of the architecture is the main thing that you'll see. So vaginal estrogen is the mainstay of treatment. Um, some contraindications, things like hormone sensitive cancers, breast cancer, and endometrial cancer. And then if a patient can't have estrogen or if she doesn't want it, other options, lubricants, vaginal moisturizers like Reflens. And then sometimes if they are having a lot of dyspareunia and they have um, kind of narrowing of the caliber of their vagina, they have to do serial dilation in order to get the vagina a little more dilated um, so they can have intercourse without pain. Okay, now we have a 50 year old. She has severe daily hot flashes. She has breast tenderness and a recent mammogram revealing overall normal findings other than dense breasts. She wants to start medication for her hot flashes. What is the best option for her? Venlafaxine. Venlafaxine. So the best treatment option is estrogen. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so she doesn't have any contraindications um, to estrogen. So 
The answer is actually A. So patients that have hot flashes, estrogen is a fast treatment. They also need progestin hormone therapy if they have a uterus. And I think you guys probably know why. Why is that? Endometrial hyperplasia. Mm -hmm. cancer. Exactly. Whatever. Yeah, so we're protecting their endometrium from that stimulation with estrogen. However, that can lead to some side effects. So sometimes women with non progestins will have breast tenderness. They can have increased breast density. They can have abnormal uterine bleeding. So a newer approach actually takes a sperm selective estrogen receptor modulator and combines it with an estrogen. And vasodoxepine, I think that's how you say the name of that drug, is the term that's used for this purpose. Um, traditionally, it's an osteoporosis medication, um, and it has an agonist antagonist dual effect, so on estrogen responsive tissues. So it's an agonist for bone, but for um, breast and endometrium, it is an antagonist. So you can use it in patients who um, are maybe having a potential for side effects related to this progesterone. Um, contraindications to HRT, so there are quite a few. So obviously a history of any hormone sensitive tumors, um, you also um, want to use it in caution in patients who have the first degree relative of breast cancer or otherwise increased risk of breast cancer. Unexplained vaginal bleeding, obviously you want to work them up for any endometrial um, cancer. Liver disease or liver dysfunction, VTE or thrombophilia, uncontrolled hypertension, um, congestive heart disease, stress PIA, and then in women who have high triglycerides, um, as oral estrogen can make that worse. And women with gallbladder disease, estrogen can make it worse, so you can consider a transdermal estrogen. And transdermal also um, has a lower risk of developing VTE compared to the oral estrogens. Um, do you guys have the Menopro MAMS app? I don't think so. I would highly recommend it. So one of my attendings in residency had a menopause clinic and we would always use this app um, to determine the patient's cardiovascular disease risk assessment. So it's this nice app, you just put in all the patient's data, so their age, um, their onset from menopause, you put in their blood pressure, their um, A1C, I believe if they have a history of diabetes, if they're a smoker, um, you put in their recent um, lipid panel, and then it tells you a percent likelihood that within the next 10 years, if they're on estrogen, they'll have a cardiovascular event. So typically, if it's a greater than 10% risk, you don't want to give them estrogen, but you know, that is still, I even think like a 5% chance it makes me a little nervous. So you can tell the patient, what is your risk of developing something like a heart attack or stroke in the next 10 years on estrogen? And then they can make their decision if their hot flat piece or cervical to eat that they want to do that. Um, or if they want to explore other options. It's called Menoper? <laughs> Menopro. Oh. Here, I'll write it in the chat. I think it's free. I've had it since intern year. I just downloaded it. I'm testing it out. Yeah, it's really nice. I love it. I use it all the time. And then also it'll tell you dosages. So it'll tell you all the different types of estrogen, oral estrogen, the patch. So you can look up the dosage there. And then it also has an algorithm for vaginal dryness, um, which is really nice too. And I think it even has like little handouts that you can show the patient on like vulvar health and that sort of thing. If you've got a patient who doesn't have a uterus, and so you're just considering estrogen alone, is the conversation pretty different? Because I know like originally the estrogen plus progesterone is what showed the increased risk of heart disease, breast cancer, PE, but the estrogen alone actually showed a reduction in heart disease and PE. So does yeah, that ever? Yeah, it's tricky. Um, the conversation is really that much different for me. I guess when I consult patients, they think 
like with that wave of health initiative. Um, the overall conclusion I think that's applicable to our patients is that, you know, in the immediate postmenopausal period, like within 10 years of the onset, um, we should be offering these things to our patients to improve their quality of life and then just talking to them about all of those risks. And you can extrapolate it by estrogen plus progesterone or estrogen alone um, to discuss the risks of all of them, like you mentioned. Now, like you mentioned. So yeah, I don't know if the overall counseling for me is too, too different. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else want to that? I have a smart phrase with a table I use. Oh, that's fun. Well, I'll steal it from you. <laughs> okay, and then finally, this is our last slide. I know you guys have been in lectures all morning, uh, but we have our non-hormonal treatments too. So this is for patients with contraindications and also patients that might just not be comfortable. Maybe they've read about the Women's Health Initiative and they're nervous about all of the risks. Um, so Paroxetine or Brisdel is the brand name um, of Paroxetine at the dosing, which is used for hot flashes. So this is the only FDA approved non-hormonal treatment for vasomotor symptoms. It does not affect weight or libido. So if you have a patient concerned about those things, it, you can offer Brisdel. Um, a contraindication is tamoxifen use. The reason why is because Paroxetine blocks the cytochrome P450 enzyme, which converts tamoxifen to its active metabolites. So that could result in decreased efficacy of their tamoxifen. If you have a patient um, who um, is on tamoxifen, you could use benlafaxine as an alternative. However, it isn't FDA approved, but really um, it has still been shown effective for the treatment of these motor symptoms. Gabapentin is another option. One side effect of that is drowsiness, as you guys know. So if you have a patient who's primarily complaining of night sweats, this might be a good option because she could just leap right through her night sweats. Um, and then finally, clonidine is another medication that has been used off-label for the treatment of hot flashes. Side effects of this, things like dry mouth, constipation, headache, dizziness. Um, so for a lot of our menopausal women, that might limit the use. And you also always want to look at their baseline blood pressure, because if you have a you know, menopausal woman with blood pressure of 90 over 60, you probably don't want to be giving her quantity because that can make her even more hypotensive. Questions on any of that? Okay, so what we reviewed today, basically the commonly missed topics across the GI level Intra-op complications, specifically GU and nerve, you guys missed um, last year. Pediatric and adolescent gyne, the two most common subtopics missed is a vulgar vaginal concerns and abnormal mass in a pediatric patient and menopause. Um, and then uh, your bread and butter topics, you know, when I look through your data, usually the junior residents miss these most commonly, the last three ectopic. AUB and SAB management, but cervical dysplasia was one that was missed pretty frequently across um, levels. And I know that you guys just had the lecture on that with Dr. Oliver. So look over her slides again and then also look at those ASCCP guidelines that just came out this year. And that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really Thank you. I really like the targeted towards like last year's. That was really nice. Oh, yeah. good. Okay. I wasn't sure what you guys usually do, but I don't know. I thought it would be more useful than just talking about ectopic pregnancy and abnormal uterine bleeding for an hour. So, because we get that kind of stuff a lot. And like you said, it's, it's a huge topic. So focusing on the, the high yield stuff was really good. And I like that. Oh, well, thank you. I'm glad it was useful. I think also you guys like, see patients with ectopic pregnancies and abnormal uterine bleeding like all the time every single day so you kind of know what you're doing um so yeah all right well have a good weekend everyone you too thank you yeah. upload it to microsoft teams or email it to one of us so we can upload it you can email yeah. it
I'll do it right. You want me to email it to you? Yeah, yeah, and I'll upload it. Okay. Thank you. I'll do that right now. Okay. All right. Bye, guys.